3 p.m. sharp and everybody stop talking. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to go a little louder. Is that better in the back? Okay. Uh, so thank you to everybody in attendance today. Um, welcome to the Salt Air Community Center uh, on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. Thanks for taking your time out of the sun to join us. I uh, want to start by acknowledging that we are gathered here on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people and very grateful to be here and doing so. Uh, start by going through a little bit of background and then a little bit of housekeeping before we begin into the presentation today. Uh, so the Cowichan Valley Regional District conducted field studies in the Saltaire area in 2021, which examined natural hazards in the coastal zone, local drivers of slope instability and potential impacts of sea level rise. An amended development uh, approval permit known as DPA-7 has been drafted as bylaw number 4427 as part of the modernized official community plan. Note this is a proposed amended development approval permit and not a new one. Both the current and proposed DPA require geotechnical support reports. Now public safety was a paramount driver in the rationale to conduct this technical research. It's also important for us to note uh, that here we're, we're here today to talk about this particular study uh, and the DPA that we're talking about is applicable to multiple electoral areas within the CBRD uh, and other studies uh, in places like Cow Bay that have similar hazard um, impact or potential impacts will be considered down the road as well. So it's not specific to Saltaire per se. Uh, we did hold a virtual community information session on the report and the draft amended development permit area on May 16th. Uh, and now the purpose of this in-person public information meeting today is to provide further opportunity to present the full salt air coast slope stability assessment by the technical authors. And we have Mr. Rick Guthrie here um, to support that today and to do a presentation. Um, we really want to take advantage of the time that we have here from the authors of the study. So we really are trying to focus the questions um, from you here today specific to the study. We have other opportunities for you to ask questions of staff, both after the session, um, there's written uh, submissions that you can do in the back, um, but we have, they've traveled here from out of province to be here with us today, so we really wanna try to take advantage of their time um, being with us today. So the presentation and draft bylaw number 4427, Development Priority Area 7, Landslide Hazard DPA 7 are on display in the room, as you have seen. Hopefully you've had a chance to take some of that information in and that can form some of the questions that you may already have. Hopefully some of those will be answered uh, further in the presentation as you see it. Um, I will allow my colleague uh, Coralie to introduce Rick a little bit further before he gets started in this presentation, but today I just wanted to acknowledge that we have uh, the director of the area, Lynn Smith, in attendance. Director Smith, do you wanna, you know, there, there she is. Uh, we also have several staff members in the room. Uh, so I'll acknowledge we have Coralie Breen, uh, our manager of strategic initiatives planning with us today. We have Kate Miller, uh, manager of environmental services here. We have our general manager of land use services, Ann Cheryl here. Uh, oh, at the back of the room, I see Clayton Postings, our manager of strategic, general manager of strategic services with us. Uh, Jeff Moore here at the front is a senior environmental technologist with us. Am I miss, oh, and, uh, Allison Garnett, one of our planners here at the front of the room, who, thank you, Allie. Uh, I don't believe I've missed anybody. Oh, and myself, if I failed to acknowledge myself, uh, I'm Chris Schumacher, Manager of Communications and Engagement for the CBRD. I see Director Ben Martman here from Area H. Uh, Director Martman in the back corner, thanks for attending as well. And if I missed anybody else of importance, I apologize. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping here. We will have a presentation that's going to begin um, by Mr. Guthrie. We will then follow that by a question and answer period. We we're hoping to have two different mics available for this. We're waiting on our second one to arrive. If that doesn't happen, I will do the handoff thing that you might be, have seen before uh, and run around the room. But hopefully there will be a position in the middle of the room for people to line up to ask questions. Um, again, we really want to try to focus this on asking questions about the technical report that you're going to hear about. Um, we do have uh, ability for people to submit comments in various forms as well, either after the meeting, following the meeting. Um, you can approach any of the staff um, to find out how to do that better, but really we're trying to focus it on questions as opposed to comments within the limited time that we have. 
The last piece of housekeeping is just that we've split this up into two separate sessions today um, in order to accommodate as many people as we can. This room has a capacity of 95 um, via the fire code. So uh, we're almost at capacity for this session. I anticipate it'll be the same for the next. So very much hoping that at 515, we can everybody exit through these doors and allow the net us a little bit of time to clean the room for the next group to come in through the front. If we do have capacity for the next session, people who want to attend both sessions are more than welcome to come in after we've allowed everybody from the first session to come in. And the last piece is that we are recording this meeting so that anybody who you know who lives in the area who wants this information will be able to view it uh, on our website once it's posted after this. With that, oh, uh, oh, you know what? I forgot to acknowledge Andrea Cross, who is also here from our GIS department in the back of the room. Sorry, Andrea, there you are. Thanks for attending. Oh, and Lauren, okay, I'm neglectful of a couple of staff members. I don't know where she was at the front door. You would have seen her as you came in. She's very humble and probably doesn't want to be acknowledged, but thanks, Lauren. And we want to acknowledge the staff or the volunteers of the Salt Air Community Center for being here to help support this. Uh, we like to give them a big round of applause actually at this moment before we start. Thank you very much. With that, I am going to pass the mic to Coralie Breen who can introduce uh, the consultants who will be leading the presentation today. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Dr. Rick Guthrie from Calgary. Um, he is a, an expert in landslide hazard analysis and with more than 27 years of experience and 15 on Vancouver Island. So welcome, Dr. Rick. Um, thank you. So thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a somewhat post-COVID actual real-life person meeting. We're excited to do this, so uh, thanks for coming out. As mentioned, we are going to, going to go through a number of slides today, and we're going to try and walk you through the posters. I realize that there's not a lot of words on some of these posters, but we're going to help you understand what they mean, uh, what we found, why, why we were looking, and, and kind of hopefully you'll have a chance to understand how that might affect you as an individual. There are a couple of things, um, as was mentioned, there are exit doors here. If for some reason you feel like you need to get out and get some fresh air, then you can go through the exit doors. There's a bathroom in the back on this side. Um, and I am at about slide three when I hand it over to Holly Bogrand, who I'll introduce in a second. I'm going to ask that the lights get turned down so that we can see the screen really well and make sure that everybody has a, a kind of a clear visibility of what we're trying to show you. And so if you are still standing at that point, you might, you know, we've, we've got a few slides to go through, so you might want to consider getting a seat sometime between now and slide three, okay? Um, why don't we just go ahead and advance these? So this is just a nice pretty picture you can see it going down. So one of the things that we should just start with is who are we? Why should you listen to us? What do we know about anything? Uh, and so let me kind of introduce the team. So this was a joint pro project between Palmer and Stantec. We uh, have got together for a couple of projects on Vancouver Island and, and we've had a good successful relationship. And the Palmer team is led by uh, my colleague, a renowned geomorphologist, uh, who currently actually is in Ontario, but does a lot of work here in BC, and his name is Robin McKillop. On the sort of one of his right hand uh, folks and one of the authors of the, of the uh, actual report is Corey McGregor. So Corey actually came, he did his degree at the University of Victoria in Earth Science, he came to uh, work for me at another company where I was also heading a geohazards group at the time. Uh, he was recommended by a bunch of people as being one of these really keen, really knowledgeable folks. And I looked at his curriculum, I looked at what he did, and I said, Corey, if you want to work for me, you're going to have to go back to school. And he took that well, he went back to school, did a bunch of work, and then worked for me for a long time, learning about landslides, went on to work for Palmer, and so we involved him in this project. Standing to my right is Ms. Holly Bogren. Uh, Holly and I have known each other for about a decade now. She did her 
did her master's degree here on Vancouver Island at the University of Victoria in coastal geomorphology. She has since been working for me, as I say, for almost 10 years, learning, uh, learning the trade around landslides, rivers, and continuing to uh, bone up on coastal geomorphology. And she now is in charge of a number of our geohazards teams. So my name, as I said, is Rick Guthrie. Um, I did a master's degree here on Vancouver Island as well. It was on landslides. Uh, at the time, it was characterizing landslides in the Sitka watershed. I went on to do a PhD at the University of Waterloo, but also uh, looking at landslides and behavior of landslides right here on Vancouver Island. I was the regional geomorphologist here for 15 years, actually ultimately the provincial geomorphologist for the Ministry of Environment, based in Nanaimo and have run up and down this island for a long time, have fairly familiar with it. Uh, I have been privileged in the process of the work that we've done. I mean, we have such an amazing natural laboratory here. I have been privileged to start to be seen as an expert, and I've been taken around the world. I have sort of semi-locally. I've been the lead researcher for Canada's largest historical landslide. That's the Mount Meager landslide at about 52 million cubic meters. Um, I have been the lead researcher for one of the deadliest landslides in the world in the last couple of decades for a single landslide that was in the Philippines in Gin Sao Gan. I was sent there by Canadian Foreign Affairs. I've been the, the largest landslide I've worked on was in Russia, where I was the the um, the country co-director for something called Science Projects for Peace, and we, it was a hundred million cubic meter landslide that you know, went 20 kilometers down the valley and did all sorts of havoc along the way. I'm currently based in Calgary. I still have family here on the island. Uh, I, as I say, I know it fairly well, and we're really thrilled to be able to contribute to some of the stuff that we know. So hopefully that gives you a sense of who we are. Okay. So I, 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 was, I was looking for this, I was actually using these uh, posters on the sidewalls as my guidance and forgetting that we had some other posters in here. So, because I'm from Calgary, I got to fly in here today and it was a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous day to fly. It really reminded me of some of the stuff that I want to talk about on this slide. So we live in an inherited landscape. And this is a landscape that has been coming to us for millions and millions of years. So Vancouver Island is largely, there's a bunch of other geologies as well, but it's largely made up of the Carloots and volcanics. And so what you want to imagine is that Vancouver Island is a little chunk of land, a little bit like Hawaii, that has been kind of blooming out in the Pacific and slowly working its way on the conveyor belt that you all know of, of as the subduction zone towards the mainland Vancouver. And we are currently still moving towards Vancouver, about the same speed that your fingernails are going. So we are crashing into the West Coast, and we will ultimately be part of that whole thing that actually gives rise all the way up to the Rocky Mountains, right? Because the Rocky Mountains were uplifted when previous terrains have crashed into the West Coast as part of this process. Now, as we move across the Pacific, with these uh, carboots and volcanics, with these, this backbone spine that have, that's formed over millions and millions of years, we get erosion, and that erosion creates sediment that comes out on the east side of the island and ultimately became lithified to become the Nanaimo lowlands. So all of the sandstones and shales, some of the coal that you're familiar with, that has been part of uh, where we are now, is part of that sort of geological background. You can actually see a pretty good poster called uh, Geoscape Nanaimo if you want to have a look at some of, it's easy to find online, it's part of a National Research Council kind of uh, poster, we do them all for cities all over the country. And you can find a little bit about our geological past. So importantly, let's call it um, peaking at about 13,000 years ago, or, or ending about 13,000 years ago, peaking 26,000, I'm going to lose my numbers a little bit, but it doesn't matter. We had ice over this thing, and not a little bit of ice. And so when I was flying over today, it's fascinating to look at the um, islands like Gabriola and uh, some of the, the nearby islands in the strait, 
because the ice can only be traveling in one direction. When you look at them, you can actually see the orientation. And when I say ice, we're talking one to two kilometers of ice, right, over our spot. So it's a huge, huge, huge amount of ice. And you know, water's heavy, right? Water's a kilo, uh, a liter, or a ton for every cubic meter. Ice is not as heavy, it's about 10% lighter than that, but it's still enormously heavy. When you've got a kilometer of ice, you are ripping up the ground. And you can actually see the signature of that ripping up the ground in the way the islands are lined, the way the bedrock is aligned, because if it was going in a different direction, it would tear all that bedrock in a different direction. It's only sandstone and shale. And so you can actually see the physical evidence of what is going on in the landscape at, at the glacial stage. The post-glacial stage is really relevant too because ice moves, as it's ripping all this stuff up, it moves a lot of sediment. And when it moves all of this sediment, it deposits and leaves sediment behind a couple of different ways. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's, we call it subglacial, onglacial, superglacial sediment. But at the end of the day, it leaves sediment behind as the ice melts back. And these become the sediments that we actually see along the coast. We also see marine sediments, or typically clays. We don't have a lot of clay on Vancouver Island, right? If you actually travel back and forth across the island, most of the sediments are fairly coarse. The way you tell clay, when I say coarse, I just mean you can feel it. The way you tell clay uh, is you can put a little bit in your mouth, rub it between your teeth, and it has no grit. It's that fine. Now, if you don't want to taste it, you can also just try and wash it off your hands in, a, in the local stream, and it tends to stick because clay has some peculiar properties. It's a rectangular shaped, you know, at the molecular level, it's rectangular shaped, and it has all of these negative charges all around it, and that allows it to um, bond with other, with other particles, which is why clay slopes sometimes seem really steep. But they have this other really funny behavior in that they fail on flatter than expected slopes because when those bonds break down, they no longer hold it up and we can actually get low, what we call low angle landslides. So there isn't a lot of clay on Vancouver Island, but it does exist in some parts. And a number of years ago when I did the uh, maps for the geomorphology of Vancouver Island, and they're publicly available as well, you can go online and search for those. There, uh, we produced some superficial geology maps. We mostly just compiled, in this instance, existing um, information that had been gathered by a whole bunch of other really brilliant scientists. And you can actually look for marine deposits. I think it's in purple on the map. And you, you'll see that one of the little areas where marine deposits do show up is around salt air. So we'll come back to that. Um, you know, it's a beautiful place, right? Like we have gorgeous, gorgeous trees, the ocean is there, we have this. We have, just as we're coming over, we have big steep cliffs, like right across from Harmack Mill, big steep cliffs where, where bedrock was harder and close to the surface. And then some other places we have these rocky beaches and then we get these pocket sand beaches, but all of these are part of this inherited landscape. And the most recent thing is that we've come along. And we haven't been here that long. Like, it's long for us because we don't live that long. But we've sort of been here, these communities have been around for 100 or 150 years, which when we're looking at millions is a relatively short amount of time. We tend to think of numbers as, because we hear bits and bytes and megabytes and gigabytes, and we tend to think of all these numbers as being fairly similar, but it's not. If you were to count to a million, just starting now, let's say you can do one number a second, you don't stop, you're gonna to get to a million in 11 and a half days. If you wanted to count to a billion, it's gonna take you 32 years, by the way. So they're not similar numbers. Um, and, and so we tend to think of these in very, very human terms and everything else is abstracted. We haven't been around very long at all. And, and so this whole community is, as I say, 100 or 150 years old, at, at least as we see it today. So, that's also going to come into play. Um, what do we have next? Yeah, uh, and, and so we, we were hired to, 
as part of this human experience, one of the things that we've noticed in the last little while is that there tends to be local coastal erosion problems, we have landslide problems, we have everybody knows of some drain over here that's landing on the slope and then a little while later the, the, the slope fails. And the, so the CVRD, who is got a, policies in place to try and help people develop, live, grow, play, and work in the communities in a safe manner that protects ourselves and the future, said we really need to understand what is actually going on along this coastline. Will you come and do a study? And so that's, that was really our initial scope of work. The yellow line shows where we were gonna be or which portion of the coast that we were considering. And we had this idea that we would look a little bit into the future for sea level rise because we know climate is changing, there's an abundant amount of evidence for it, and then there's a kind of a, a general planning rule that, all right, if we're gonna look for sea level rise, how, how high do we get? Like, do we look, how far into the future do we look? It becomes somewhat arbitrary where on that line you stop, and so the general planning rule is something like a meter of sea level rise, and so that was kind of the parameters with which we set. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Holly Bogran for a, a moment to, uh, go through some of the work that we began to find uh, as we were doing that and looking at the coast, some of the field work that she and Corey did, uh, and kind of tell you what we found. Um, so as, as Rick described, um, we're here at Salt here, we have this flat over steep terrain along the coastline, so this, this very flat terrain and then our steep bluffs down to the, the sea. Um, the relief in this area varies from sea level, so about zero meters to 50 meters above sea level. And the bluffs are steep to moderately steep, so up to 35 degrees in areas. Um, there's a complicated surficial geology in this area that's related to that imperative landscape that Rick was talking about. So glacial advances and retreats in the area, glacial outwash, changes in sea level over time that have all left some signature on the landscape and have made it a little bit more difficult to interpret for the Saltaire coast. The surficial geology or the published surficial geology for this area varies depending on the author. Um, some show that it's predominantly thick and continuous tills, so it might have uh, be, be comprised of various coarse materials, fines, etc. or some say it's predominantly marine deposits, so those clay deposits that Rick was talking about are, are finer materials. We reviewed a number of geotechnical reports for the area that have already been completed, and generally they described relatively shallow failures along the bluffs here, excepting one report that identified a backscar passing through a house. So we expected generally to see shallow failures along the bluffs. Um, just wanting to place one meter of sea level rise in context here. So that blue line there is the one meter sea level rise contour that was modeled for the Saltair coastline. Um, we can see a little bit of a closer look there. So that's meaningful um, because it moves that active erosion area from the sea up, um, you know, backwards towards the bluff, and in response, the bluffs may retreat over time. So we had a two-day field program to help inform our assessment. We did in fact see that relatively shallow failures were common along the coastline. And we observed, uh, so actually here we have an example of one of those relatively shallow failures. Um, these failures may also be related to undercutting um, or perhaps uncontrolled discharge of stormwater. Um, we can move to the next one. Thank you. Uh, we we did note that where we're able to look directly at the, the sediments in, in place, that there is a higher clay content um, along some portions of the slope and clay seams, which were um, observed specifically along the portions of the bluff with greatest relief, so from Boulder Point kind of south to Porter Creek. The majority of the shoreline is in fact hardened, so we can see here, um, it's not always 
necessarily affected. We have a, some failing seawalls here or undercutting. Um, there are some of the, the natural sediments underneath there being exposed from wave action. And then if you just go to the next slide, thank you. Um, and, the, and for the remaining natural shoreline segments, they are generally undercut. Uh, there are some large wave debris assemblages, which in some cases can protect the coastline from erosion, but when they become rafted, they can in fact batter um, the coastline and contribute more to erosion. So all of our observations from the field, um, as well as those that we noted from the published geotechnical reports, are summarized in the appendix of the report. And so, for example, if we had saw an observed slope stability issue, there was a pink triangle. Um, if we saw an outlet, there is a green triangle. And then if there was a combination of observations at a location, we do have specific symbology for that as well. So if you want to take a deeper dive, um, that is available in the appendix of the report. So with those observations, what we would expect to normally see is a setback distance that took into account the kinds of slope stability issues that we were finding along the coastline. Um, in the 60s, the US began developing a technology where they shot lasers from airplanes and looked at the time it took for those lasers to come back to the airplanes. And use the time that it took to start to create a model of what the ground looked like. By 1981, that had a term, it was called LIDAR, which stood at the time for light detection and ranging and now frequently stands for, less, uh, for laser imaging detection and ranging. So despite the fact that LIDAR existed since about 1981, it's really only seen dramatic use in the last decade and every year, even now, it sees more and more uh, actual use. And what LIDAR does is it provides us with a bare earth view of the landscape. So if you've ever been walking through a forest and you look up and you can see the light in the sky, then LIDAR can show you where the ground is for the same reasons, because the airplane goes by and it shoots millions and millions of shots with the laser. And every place that you see a hole, a laser can make its way down. So actually you get back something that we call a point cloud. Uh, I forgot to mention that actually Holly worked for uh, Terra Remote Sensing on Vancouver Island here for a while doing LIDAR studies. So everywhere you get something back, maybe what you get back is the tree leaf, right? So you, so you get a point cloud that shows all of these different layers, essentially a three-dimensional cloud and what's known as the last return is the ground surface. And so LIDAR data is incredibly useful. So this is a LIDAR image, and we're gonna show you a bit more in a second, uh, with the salt air community kind of overlaid on top, and you can see that one meter blue sea level change line. So if we look at the next one now, we're gonna zoom in a bit, and you can see the bare earth imagery. Now, you know, when I say bare earth, in fairness, some of these, you know, you can see a little, you can see some buildings, you can work out some roads, there's, there's a little bit of noise, but by and large, what LIDAR does is it allows us to look at the earth in a very, very new way. It gives us an unprecedented amount of detail and information that we can't even get through air photo interpretation, despite many of us being trained in that for many, many years. So by a show of hands, how many people can see a giant cookie or cookie monster bite out of the coastline in that image? I have one hand. Oh, there's a couple more. Really, like, can is because anyone not see the cookie monster bite out of that image along the coastline? Cannot see it. Okay, so let's just go to the next slide. So here's where it is. Can you back that up again? One of the reasons that this is important is because despite the fact that the feature is so large, despite the fact that it's so obvious, if you were driving there, it would just be a little hill, and then it's still flat, and then there's a little hill. There's no particular reason 
that you would see that feature in real life. For starters, we're not very big. We don't know, we not only don't live a long time in this world, but we're also really small compared to the scale of the world, right? And so it's completely conceivable that we would have no idea it exists. So this was our first hint. This was the first one we saw where we went, oh, there's a landslide here. It's a low angle landslide, which means we know there's clay somewhere in there. And it, it's really far back in the community. So actually, Holly called me one day and said, I've, we've done all the field work. We found all of these things. We were starting to deal with the line, but the problem is, is we have a couple of landslides that we've noticed that are really big and they're extend beyond this line. What do we do? So she showed me the lighter and right away went, oh yeah, we have, we have to start looking at those and we're gonna map them out. So it's not just one. Now, some of these we know about, right? Because if we go into Stocking Creek, um, there's a bunch of trees. I suspect if we, like there's a reason that Stocking Creek is divided the way it is, is because there's some evidence that the slopes aren't entirely stable in there. And if we were to walk around, we would see pistol butt trees and we might even see small head scars and we would see features that looked like uh, signs of landslides. But to our knowledge up to now, it hasn't been as clearly laid out because no one has looked at the LIDAR and no one has built it out the way we have on this, in this example. So you can see examples like this one uh, where there's a bit more of a rotational component, but it is still a relatively low angle landslide. And then up Porter Creek, we also see others both along the coast and up the creek. So this tells us a couple of things. So not only do we have overwhelming evidence for the fact that these landslides are there, we have overwhelming evidence that they are deep back into the community, as opposed to shallow landslides. When, when Holly says shallow, we're talking like between half a meter, maybe a couple of meters deep, um, kind of perpendicular to the surface, right? Well, that's not what we're talking about here. These are much, much deeper. But we also know that they need to be initiated by something. Um, and so, because they're occurring specifically where the slopes have been undercut by waves or incised by the stream. And so we are having to intersect some kind of a clay layer. So we mapped about 14 of them in our initial mapping. We actually extended it later on, but for now we'll just talk about these 14. So we mapped about 14 of them. Well, now we have a problem because some of them are, you know, really quite large. And we know that it's going to have an impact on, on things like the development permit. It's going to, it has a potential to impact people who live in these communities. And we don't want to arbitrarily just assign a, a massive width to the, um, to the setback, so there has to be some kind of physical basis for how we would assign a setback distance. But we also know in good conscience that there's a hazard tolerance policy um, that, that part of assigning that means that we have to represent what that hazard really looks like. And so what we did is we looked at something that we called a modified Farbochon angle. So it is a term that was used in Europe, thus then you can sort of see that's not a typical Canadian term, that was used to look at the runout of, of rapid landslides. So from the head scarf to the end of the runout was considered the Farbochon angle. So we've modified it here slightly, but based on a whole bunch of complementary research where this has been done in other parts of the world. So other parts of the world are things like Norway. There are also places like Alberta and Quebec where low angle landslides are actually common. And we have other issues like this up in uh, Terrace and Kitimat area. Luckily here, they're actually not nearly as bad as most of those other places I just mentioned. And so what we're trying to do is we are trying to identify the basal shear surface of the landslide. Now when I say basal shear surface, a landslide is really controlled by two overwhelming forces. One is the, the, the driving force, so it's the weight of the soil
pushed by gravity against some kind of shearing surface, against kind of some kind of slippery surface, and they're resisting soil. And the resisting soil is the same thing. It's just, it's just like a, um, it's typically on a flat surface, and it doesn't move. It's the, it's supporting the weight. So you know, one of the things that people might do is if they're making a cut in a slope, they might support the lower portion of that. And what they're doing is they're replacing the, what they removed, the resisting surface, with something that they would support it by. So in the process, what we imagine, so the real curve, there's some kind of curve in here. It's not this line, but this line represents the angle at which that curve daylights. And so we use this modified Farrochamp angle and we looked at all of the 14 line slides that we identified. And then we had to, and we looked at the angles of all of them. Now some of them were actually reasonably steep. Some of them were just pure rotational line slides, kind of typical 24 or 26 degrees. But lots of them weren't. And what we then did is we said, okay, in order to reasonably say which portion of the community is won't be affected by a slide like this, we need to know what that minimum angle is. And so that minimum angle was about 11 degrees. And there were three or four slides that were kind of in that range between 11 and 12 degrees as measured like this. So what we then did is we said, okay, we're looking into the future. So the waves, with a meter of sea level rise, the waves are likely to erode a little bit into the shoreline. That's the whole point of the sea level rise exercise. So we need to extend the Farbochung angle from that new wave location. And because we need to account for all sorts of different topography in some kind of rational manner, we're going to extend it to the point where it daylights whatever that topography is. And so we did, you see those little pink lines on the uh, right-hand picture there? So we ran the Farbochung angle of about 11 degrees through each of a hundred lines. So here's six examples. But if you go into the report, they're all there, every single one. And so what you're actually seeing is depending on the nature of the shoreline topography, the setback has all different distances. So if a, if a shoreline topography is not very steep, we arrive at 11 degrees very early, and then the setback distance would be close to the shoreline. But if it is a large, if there's a large block, so this one is interesting because this is actually a landslide. There's the headscarf right there. So that's a block that's moved on some curved surface under there, and it's daylight. So it hasn't made it all the way back to the Farbochung, and it might not, or maybe we'll just get this little piece here that will eat back over time, but we need to make sure that all the pieces that we saw could reasonably be contained within that line. So this is what it looks like with a hundred cross sections. And with the landslides that we have there over the lighter. And then we use that at every single cross section to stitch together this green line, which is the uh, which is the setback line. So here's what it looks like with properties on it. So this isn't without some impact because you know the development permit requires that we get in there and we do some geotechnical analysis if we want to make changes to those properties. And so we want to be sure that we've understood this properly. Um, and by the way, we went on to look at, yeah, you can see some of the landslides that we, we went on to work our way up uh, Stockton and Potter Creeks as well. So the other thing we did, and I apologize, we're going to get a little bit mathy, but not too bad um, for a second, is we, we realized that we also needed to answer the question for the community, which would be, well, why didn't we know? Like, we've been here our whole lives. We haven't seen this. Why haven't we seen this? If these are such a big deal, you get where I'm going with it. So one of the things that we wanted to do is understand 
the hazard term. So when we talk about risk, we usually talk about hazard by consequence. And now, those are very simple concepts. So the hazard is the probability that something can occur that we don't, that, that will have a consequence, that has the potential to have impact to us. And we think about hazard in terms of the um, likelihood of that thing occurring over time. Okay, so we pick years, so, so that's the probability per year. Consequences, obviously, you know, you can imagine the wily e. coyote falling off the cliff with that little by sign. The consequence is the, that, that final result. So we don't, we didn't get into consequence here, but we did break out the hazard term. So hazard, the hazard term has two components. It has the time and the space component. So the space component is just, hey, if I'm inside that green zone, what's the likelihood that I'm gonna run into one of these, right? And the time is, what's the likelihood I'm gonna run into one of these this year? And there is a, so the, the policy talks about, for instance, um, they, there's a, the CBRD tolerance policy talks about the ability to work within um, zones where the probability of death of an individual is one in 10,000, one in 10,000 to one in 100,000, or less than one in 100,000. So those are where we start to incorporate the consequences. Uh, and there are, oh, there are other possible consequences besides just the death of an individual, but, but those policies are available to look at online. <clears throat> so, in order to work out, I actually will back up one. In order to work out the spatial term, that's what that HS piece is, all we need to do is look at the percentage of the green zone that we built occupied by each of those 14 landslides. So it's literally just dividing area by area. Okay, so there's a big area, each landslide occupies a very small part of it, and that's the spatial term for that. So if it occupied 1% of the total area, for instance, we would give it a 0 0.01 term. The time is harder. What we frequently do is we look at something called activity state. So we try and understand where for each landslide, when it was active. Now the problem here is that we know we have some landslides active within the last five years, um, but we don't know kind of what the upper limit is. So this is where some geomorphological judgment starts to come into it, some an understanding of history uh, and, and looking at forests that are over top. And so what we do, this is, that, uh, this is one of the landslides, and you can see, for instance, that we've got enough time in this landslide to develop some gullies. We have some structure to it, and it's beginning to become smooth as opposed to very, very... Uh, a, a fresh landslide in LIDAR has a, quite a distinct, sharp head scarp, and as it moves through time, we get local erosion, and some of those uh, some of those features get a little bit more muted. So, we, uh, several of us, kind of got together, looked at what the possibilities were, looked at what the history was, what the earthquake history's been here on the island, what the um, sea level history has been here on the island, what the precipitation history has been here on the island, what the vegetation history was showing us, keeping in mind that there's a lot of it would be second growth and so on. So taking that one with a grain of salt. And we estimated that the landslides that we had identified were younger than 500 years or up to, let's say, 500 years. Now we could be out. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We could be out, maybe that could be, let's imagine we were out by, like, it was twice that, maybe it was a thousand years. We've done a sensitivity analysis just to see if it would fundamentally change anything, and at the end of the day, it doesn't. So we'll come back to that. So this is kind of how, so here's a, here's a good example of something that's occurred within the last five years, and you don't see the head scarf, but it works its way up there. And then this one is maybe on the order of, 500 years old, and we saw evidence for some that were in the order of 50 years old. We saw some that were on the order of 150 years old. The difficulty became within our scope of work to actually go, you know, 
do tree cores in those, do sediment, take them off to carbon-14 analysis. Like there's all sorts of things you could conceivably do that would allow you to maybe refine what this looks like. But if we accept that they have occurred within that approximate time range of 500 years, one of the things that we can do is say, all right, what if we assume they're normally distributed? Now, what I mean by normally distributed is just that uh, the landslides are occurring randomly through time. Now, they, that may not be, right? So we had a, we had a great earthquake, uh, I think, in um, the year 1700, I believe, it's the last one. And so that might have been responsible for a couple of the landslides, but we know that at least some of them are kind of on the order of 50 years, some of them are on the order of a couple hundred years. So it seems like a reasonable assumption to say, let's just, for the moment, assume that we distribute them randomly through time. Next slide. So we create one of these nasty tables. So let me show you what we're gonna look at first to try and walk through this table. All we're gonna do initially is focus on those first columns. So the very first column is just the landslide number. Remember, we looked at 14 of them. The second column is how big it is. So quite a range, right? So every, if you don't know, a hectare, HA, is 10,000 square meters. So that's equivalent roughly to 100 meters times 100 meters, or 250 meters long by, was it 40 meters wide? Had a moment. <laughs> um, 10 meters long by a thousand meters, sorry, 10 meters wide by a thousand meters long, it's that kind of thing, right? So, so we have some landslides are fairly large, you know, over on or about or a little bit over three hectares, and we have others that are quite small. So, so this is half a hectare, it's 5,000 square meters. So we look at all of those, and then the HS term, that's the next column over, that is the percent of the green zone that the landslide occupies, right? So 0.02 is just, or 0.028, the first one is 3%. 0 0.0097, and it looks complex, but it's not, it's almost 1%. Okay, so all of these landslides collectively occupy, what was it, about 11% or something? Of the, it's in, the, it's in the report, but so they occupied some overall percentage. All right, how do we get to the, the time term? So what we did, remember we thought they could be randomly distributed. So if we assign a random number, not the right number, just any random number, between five and 500 to each one, and we multiply those all through, then the variation should sort itself out. So if I take, 14 of us right now out of the crowd, and I don't know how old everybody is, but I can see most of us are sort of my age or older. So we could say, let's start at 50 and say, probably younger, I'm just making it up, but let's say younger than 80. And I could randomly assign a number to each one of those 14 people. Well, I'm gonna be wrong probably with the age of each individual but the average will probably be close to reality. And so that's essentially what we did here. We assigned a random number that we expect is wrong for each individual landslide, but we expected that would normalize out when we looked at all of them, and so then we could get an, an overall, um, overall the, the, the time component would be correct. And so the way you get something called the probability of occurrence is to multiply the space term by the time term. So if you have an iPhone and you want to pull it out, you can multiply and get what we call the probability of occurrence, the PO, for each of those 14 landslides. And then that gets averaged to, uh, sorry, it doesn't get averaged. There was a formula that we showed a couple slides back. We don't need to see it again, but there's a, there's a specific way of pulling that together to get the overall probability of occurrence. Okay, um, the problem is, of course, that what if you assign a really short term or a really, a really short amount of time or a really long amount of time, just randomly, to the really big landslides? But then it's gonna influence the overall score. 
or your really small landslides, and it, again, it'll have an effect on your overall score. So instead of doing this once, we did it 10 times. And so all the rest of the rows are just the other iterations of the same exercise. And so what you end up with on the bottom is a probability of occurrence, and it shows what the overall variation is. And so, the, so we use the, the average probability of occurrence. It's this number here. 0 0.00, essentially 0 0.002. And standard deviation tells us what the variability is amongst our tests, uh, amongst our uh, samples. And you can see the standard deviation is really low. In this case, it's 7 out of 10,000. Um, but it's relevant, it's relative to those scores, right? So, but the standard deviation was quite good. And you can see for yourself, 0 0.0018 isn't that far from 0 0.0012 or 0 0.0024 or 0 0.00136. And so we felt like we had arrived at a reasonable number. Oh, that's just me showing the whole table. Next one. Which looks like this. So that's rounded up a tiny bit, 0 0.0019. And what that means is you can reasonably expect in kind of anywhere within that green zone, you can reasonably expect a landslide of a similar nature to the ones that we mapped with a return period of something like one in 500 years. So why haven't we seen these before? Well, because one in 500 years doesn't come around that much, right? It's a lot more than one in 10,000. So what we have to start worrying about now is what we call the exceedance intervals. We build communities to last. We build houses to last. We don't intend to occupy them for a single year. We intend them to be around for 50 years. Or maybe we're gonna, maybe they'll be around for generations. So if they're gonna be around for generations, then we need to start looking at what the likelihood is that something like this will occur within the lifetime of a building or a community within that zone. So the probability that we're going to see it in any given year is substantially less than 1%, right? That's 0.2 of 1%. But the probability that we're going to see landslides of this nature in 100 years is almost 20%. And so this is why we care, we're trying to find a way to protect the community and to develop uh, in a manner that doesn't make this a more serious problem. Hope. So a number of recommendations came from the report, both for the public and for the CBRD. For the public, um, we recommended the development uh, when you're applying for development or redevelopment within the setback area, that a detailed geotechnical assessment by a qualified professional be performed. And then there are some additional guidelines that were added to the existing development permit area. Um, and we will go through these in the next slide. So this is just an amend amended development permit area. And uh, these additional guidelines were added uh, to the coastal slope stability uh, area. For the CBRD, we recommended more detailed investigation along the Saltier coastline to better differentiate um, terrain within the study area. So to maybe tease out where those problematic clays were or where bedrock is closer to surface and then to better constrain the age of the mapped landslides so that we have more understanding of the probability of occurrence. Um, in addition, we recommended stormwater management, uh, a stormwater management plan for key locations along the coastline. So the, the amended guidelines or the additional guidelines that were added to the development permit area documents are firstly that driveway and surface runoff or other concentrated surface runoff shouldn't be directed towards the crest of the bluff, um, but rather directed through drains and pipes to the bottom of the bluff or 
uh, a professionally identified destination like a stormwater storage area. Next, to avoid installation of ponds, swimming pools, and lawn irrigation systems in the area as they can contribute to water on the slope. Um, development should not involve dumping of soil or other material over the bluff edge because that can load the top of the slope, uh, leading to slope instability. Consideration should be given prior to removing any vegetation um, of the inter of interdependency effects where a group of plants living together protect each other from disturbance by wind, erosion, and other natural processes. And revegetation undertaken to promote slope stability uh, is encouraged to be, done, uh, be designed by a landscape architect or other qualified person. Native species uh, identified for the coast by the Stewardship Center for the BC, uh, for BC, your marine waterfront should be used for revegetation. If you'd like to see more detail uh, on the bylaw, you can go to this website here. So thank you, we'll open it up for questions now. Okay, wow, thank you everyone for your hour of attention. Uh, I think in the essence of health, because we're here for health and safety, everybody should stand up, spin around, or shake your neighbor's hand, something like that, stretch your legs a little bit. Uh, so it looks like the way that our Q&A session is going to occur is me coming through the room. And rather than like picking and choosing across the room, I think uh, what I'll do is work my way down one side, back up through the middle, down the other side and attempt to uh, answer every question uh, possible in the time that we have. I will note that I failed to point out one of my colleagues, Sonny Brisky. You see him by the door. He is our building inspection officer. He'd be the individual might be dealing with if you have an application within the uh, DPA. So question, specific questions like that can be directed to him uh, following the uh, Q&A session. Uh, once again, to point out a bathroom is in the corner. Please form an orderly queue. And uh, just a reminder that we have a uh, respectful conduct policy for the CBRD, so please keep that in mind when you're framing your questions uh, and comments that are submitted. Uh, so we'll start over in this corner here. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please raise your hand and I will bring the mic over to you, sir. And if you could state your name um, before you pose your question, that'd be great. Uh, 